Chapter 24 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 24 Prayer, Concentration, and Silence The subjects treated in this chapter will probably be of special value to the student after that immediately preceding it. We have already spoken of the value of prayer in certain cases, and it may be said that both silence and concentration, under certain conditions, will always prove of great value, not only in the cure of obsession, but at all other times when dark clouds loom up on the horizon. In order to secure the best results from these psychological processes, however, they should be practiced according to certain laws, and the reason for their operation should be thoroughly understood by the student. What the Silence Really Signifies What is called the silence in general New Thought philosophy is a peculiar psychic state into which the student enters in order to secure certain results. As the term implies, quiet or silence are necessary factors, but they are mere means to an end. Silence in itself would achieve nothing. It means that in this condition, thereby induced, certain practices may be followed which produce the desired results. Concentration is the focusing of the entire being at any given moment upon a central point of interest, either inward or outward as the case may be. It may be upon some object or some inner thought or psychic condition. Concentration upon objects is usually employed as a mere outward exercise to train the mind to act according to instructions, so to speak, so that when the time comes it may be employed in useful and helpful psychic activity. The Value of Concentration Concentration means power. The more we concentrate on anything, the more certain it is to be accomplished, and the better will the results be. Just as a number of streams meeting at a certain point will create a rushing, mighty current, so in the same manner will scattered psychic activity and forces, if brought to a common point, produce certain powerful results, which may be centered, or turned into one direction or into another. One of the chief practical uses of concentration is the use it may be put to, to hold or bind the self together. We should never let it be scattered in a variety of separate channels of expression, but rather concentrated into one single powerful unit. Just as the strands of a rope may become separated, so the mind may become disintegrated and lose its initial power. In this weakened condition, it can be acted upon by other minds and forces, just as the single strands of rope can be broken, but the whole rope would resist any strain put upon it. The mind, when concentrated and acting under proper direction and control, is similarly impervious to all outside influences which may not be desired, and at the same time is itself a powerful factor either for good or evil. Concentration Exercises A few simple exercises in concentration may here be given, which will be found useful not only in psychic development, but in every phase of life. 1. Read a page of some heavy technical book, the meaning of which is not at all clear to you. Reread the page with the determination to understand what it means. Read this over a number of times if necessary, never letting your will relax for a moment, but determined to understand the thought of the author. If you do this, you will, after a few readings, the number varying, be enabled to grasp fully what is meant. 2. Place a watch in front of you and look at the second hand until it has completed the circle marking the minute. During this process, never let your thoughts wander from the second hand for a moment. Concentrate upon it fully. You will probably find that your thoughts are wandering, and that you cannot even for the space of a minute fix them absolutely under your control. Practice this until you have succeeded in accomplishing it. 3. Call up before your mind's eye a picture of a certain living friend. Hold this image in front of you as long as possible making the details in every way as clear as you can by endeavoring to fill out mentally the color of the hair, of the eyes, the complexion, and any peculiar markings that you can remember. Now, when the face is vivid before your mind's eye, see whether you can discover any peculiarities in the face hitherto unknown to you. If you note anything of the kind, ascertain the next time you see this friend whether or not these impressions are correct. 4. Call up before your mental vision the face of some dead relative or friend. Concentrate upon it 
holding it firmly before you in space. Study it closely, filling in all details as before. Finally, when you have held this vividly for a minute or so, without wavering in your attention, open your psychic or mental ears, so to speak, and see if you can receive any message from the person whose face is before you. This will be found a very useful practice on occasion at the beginning of your mediumship, and will enable you possibly to receive direct communications when you have tried in every other way and failed. You will not be able to do so, however, until you have mastered fully this faculty of concentration. THE DYNAMIC POWER OF THE MIND Having progressed so far, you may now concentrate upon certain mental or psychic processes while willing or demanding that some return be made as a result of your volitional activity. Remember that every thought you send out into the universe attracts to itself others of a like nature and ultimately returns to the sender with added power, just as a boomerang returns to the thrower. Altruistic thoughts, such as love, justice, forgiveness, etc., will therefore return to the owner and make him happier for having thought them. Evil and malevolent thoughts will, on the contrary, return and make the sender more unhappy and more innately evil in consequence. The path we travel, whether it be upward or downward, always gets easier as we proceed. We are helped along not only by the powers of good or darkness, but by our own thoughts and their results. Thoughts are things. No thought is ever annihilated, and there is evidence to show that thought can take material form on occasion and influence, either for good or evil, those at a distance. This will be more fully explained, however, in subsequent chapters. THE VALUE OF PRAYER We must now say a few words on prayer, and its great value to one who sends out the prayer thought. There are many who believe that prayer is superstition, since they do not believe in a personal God who grants or answers prayers, but rather in an impersonal creative power which orders all things according to unvarying laws. Even on this theory, however, prayer, under certain conditions, is fully justified. For, in the first place, as we have just seen, helpful and wholesome thoughts tend to bring their own reward. In the next place, prayer is an auto-suggestion of great value and its influence upon the mental and physical life is frequently very great. In the third place, prayer will help and buoy you up by giving you added confidence and belief in your powers. In the fourth place, inasmuch as telepathy is a fact in nature, you may, while in that condition, reach the minds of other human beings who can help you and will actually do so without knowing why. The many interesting cases which may be found of answers to prayers, bringing a material return, fully justify its use from that point of view. Fifth, you can doubtless reach by telepathy friends in the spirit life who may be brought into more or less direct touch with you during the prayerful condition of mind, which is certainly closely akin to certain phases of subjective mediumship. They may, in this manner, be made aware of your condition for the first time and will then endeavor to help you. Sixth, by prayer, you may bring yourself into harmony with the great cosmic currents of good which, as before explained, are playing hither and thither upon our universe in much the same way as light, heat, gravitation, electricity, and other material forces play or act upon it and us. All these material factors must be taken into account apart from the possibility that there is a receptive, loving, and protecting power in the world which is capable of helping us in time of need. Prayer in Obsession in obsession cases particularly, prayer is of value because of the relief from tension and the wholesome mental attitude induced. Just as a drowning man will clutch at a straw, so those who are in terrible distress will frequently resort to this practice, when they would not think of doing so at any other time, and in a sense they are justified in so doing. There is an old saying that man's extremity is God's opportunity. It may be that prayer, in the ordinary sense of the word, is not needed during an ordinary, healthy life, provided that it is lived in accordance with the laws of nature and according to its own highest mental and spiritual insight. At the same time, there may be occasions when it is justified and helpful, and certainly it is proved so in certain cases of difficulty and obsession. How Prayer Cures The beneficial effects of prayer may be explained in many cases quite simply. 
As explained in the chapter devoted to the subconscious mind, certain groups of thoughts tend to become bound together, forming what is known as a complex. If this activity be wholesome, the result is beneficial, and in fact, all our educational processes depend upon this complex formation. On the other hand, these groups of thoughts may be harmful, in which case they tend to press upon the mind from beneath, in much the same way that physical tumors might press upon some healthy structure in the body and impede its functional activity. The mind, therefore, becomes diseased by reason of this pressure, and will only resume its wholesome attitude when this pressure is removed. By means of hypnotic suggestion and spiritual treatment, the mind may be opened up and explored, and this complex found and removed. This once done, the mind is restored to its wholesome activity, and the cure is complete. This is known in technical language as the purging treatment. As soon as the unwholesome load is removed, the mind is cured. Now, in prayer, when a full and free confession is made, this same purging process occurs. The mind is freed from its burden, and is consequently restored to health by its own inner nature. This being so, it may be seen that prayer as such is a real curative process, and in many types of obsession and similar cases, it may be employed effectually, as before said, as a therapeutic measure of great value in curing the sick mind. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington Chapter 25 The Human Fluid the human body is charged with a certain magnetism which differs from all other forms of magnetism and electricity in the world. All other forces of which we have knowledge are non-intelligent, and have to be guided and directed by mind or by some law, in order to bring about any definite or desired result. It is therefore meaningless to explain the continued and consecutive movements of the planchette board or any similar instrument by saying it is due to magnetism, or to electricity, or to any similar power. These are all blind forces and must be directed, in order that any intelligent result may be obtained. The vital magnetism, which is present in the body, is also a blind force, but it is under the control of the subconscious mind, and under certain conditions, to be spoken of later, may be played upon or manipulated by external intelligences. In this way, the various results are obtained. Nature and Properties of the Fluid This vital magnetism appears to be fluidic or semi-fluidic in form, and capable of flowing from one organism into another. It is upon this principle that various magnetic cures are based, the fluid running from the operator's fingers into the body of the patient treated. That this fluidic energy is present in any human body may be proven in a number of ways. In the first place, the human aura, which I described in an earlier chapter, is partly a manifestation of this vital activity, the colors being the varying vibratory counterparts of the energy radiated. In psychometry, again, it is this vital energy which passes into objects, impregnating them with its fluidic properties. Each individual has his own peculiarly constituted and personal vital magnetism, and this differs from all others in quality and properties. A fully developed psychic is enabled to distinguish these, one from another, and a medium in a trance may be enabled to get into communication with a deceased person through or by means of this fluidic impression left upon it as explained in the chapter devoted to trance. One or two practical examples or exercises may serve to show the student the reality of this fluidic emanation and how he may employ these to convince his skeptical friends also of its reality. Experiment to prove the existence of the fluid. 1. A very simple test is the following. Hang a dead black cloth over the back of a chair and see that no light falls directly on the cloth. The light in the room should be somewhat subdued, and you should stand between it and the cloth, so as to throw your hands, held against the latter, into shadow. Now approach your two hands, one to the other, and touch the fingertips together, the hands being otherwise opened wide, palms turned toward yourself, and thumbs pointing toward the ceiling. In this condition you will probably find that as the first and fourth fingertips touch, the second and third have to be bent considerably to touch one another. The hand should be at a distance of about 3 inches from the black cloth and about 15 inches from your face. Hold the fingertips together for about 30 seconds. Then very gradually pull them apart and you will see, 
coming from and joining your fingers streams of whitish misty vapour, which is the fluid connection between the hands, which you have established by the previous contact. If you move the fingers slightly up and down after they have been separated an inch or so, you will find that the stream or bands of light follow the fingers, still connecting them, which will prove that this is not due to a hallucination or to what is called persistence of vision. How to magnetize water. 2. Place two glasses of water side by side on the table. Over one of these, place the tips of your fingers, held together so as to form a point as much as possible. Hold these over the water in one glass for four or five minutes, willing that your vital magnetism should pass into the water and affect it. If now you ask a sensitive person who has not seen you perform the experiment to pick out the glass of water which has been treated magnetically, he will be able to do so almost invariably, and will tell you that the water sparkles as though charged with some effervescent gas. Life Preserved by the Human Fluid some recent experiments conducted by a group of scientific men in Bordeaux, France, have proved conclusively that the human body radiates a form of vital energy which may be extremely powerful in its results. A lady possessing the power of projection or externalizing this vital energy in a remarkable degree discovered that by placing her hands for 15 or 20 minutes daily for a period of two or three weeks over certain dead objects such as oysters, canary birds, fishes, and even larger animals, such as guinea pigs and rabbits, she was enabled to preserve them indefinitely. That is, instead of decomposing as they ordinarily would have done, they dried up or mummified and were preserved for months with no changes whatever taking place in their substance. They never decomposed. Proofs of the Human Fluid This fact was fully endorsed by several chemists and physicians who studied her case and they stated that this was due to the fact that the vital emanation coming from her body killed or destroyed the bacteria usually present in all these bodies after death. This could be traced with the microscope. For example, six oysters were allowed to decompose partially, while six were treated by her. The six that were treated never decomposed at all, but dried up or desiccated without any putrefaction. Now, when the other half-dozen oysters had partially decomposed, and bacteria could be seen under the microscope, Madame X was requested to place her hands over the oysters and treat them. After 15 minutes treatment, they were again examined and found that thousands of bacteria had been killed. At the end of a few days, they had all disappeared, and the oysters dried up, and thenceforward, no decomposition whatever was noted. This is a very striking proof of the reality of the human fluid and its peculiar action in certain cases. There is evidence to show, however, that in other instances its action is different from this, and that it imparts life and energy rather than proves destructive, as in the above unique case. Many persons have the power of preserving the life of flowers by treating them with their hands in a similar manner every day, and the student might well try this experiment and to see what extent he can preserve the life of certain flowers. Others of a like nature being preserved at the same time by another person and under similar conditions to note the difference, if any, between the two sets. It is this vital magnetism which, projected beyond the bodily limits under the action of the will, is responsible for many physical phenomena, as we shall see in chapter 38. How material objects become charged by the fluid. Material objects, particularly of a sponge-like nature, such as wood, are capable of being charged up very highly by this vital magnetism, and when this is the case they become en rapport, with the medium, who is enabled to move or manipulate them from a distance by his power of will, because of this vital fluidic connection. We shall speak more fully of this, however, in the chapter devoted to physical phenomena. It may be proved experimentally also that this fluidic magnetism is either capable of sensing pain or is the means whereby pain is carried from the nerve centers to the consciousness. Exteriorization of Sensibility under certain conditions, the fluidic body, which is the inner part of the physical body and acts as its double, may be hypnotic, and magnetic processes can be removed entirely from the physical body, in which case it may be set upon by the suggestion from others present at the time. For example, Colonel Albert de Rochas of Paris succeeded in entirely disengaging or separating the fluidic body of his subject from the physical body and gradually removed it to greater and greater distances until it stood several feet from the entranced subject's physical organism. He then pricked the surface of the fluidic body with needles, 
and the sleeping subject experienced these sensations of pain in her own physical body at the spot or point exactly corresponding to the point picked on the etheric body. Repercussion This seems to show that there is a direct vital or magnetic link between the etheric and the physical organisms, and that injury done to the one reacts upon the other by means of what is known as repercussion. This is a very significant fact when we remember that in materializing seances, it sometimes happened that the figure is seized or in some way injured by the sitter, and that the entranced medium is injured in exactly the same way that the materialized figure is injured. This fact has long been known to experienced spiritualists. This curious fact also has great significance and throws an interesting sidelight on many of the phenomena of so-called witchcraft. We know that many of these stories relate that the witch, assuming another form, visited other scenes or localities and if cut, shot, or injured there, she herself was found the next day to have these exact injuries, though lying in her bed at some distance from the scene of the event in question. Such stories certainly appear more credible when we take into consideration the above facts, for both sets of phenomena seem to depend upon repercussion. How the human fluid may impress photographic plates. The human fluid may also be proved to exist by means of photography, if a sensitive plate be wrapped in black paper and the hands of the psychic or medium of suitable temperament be placed upon it, the fluidic radiation coming from the hands and fingers will influence the plate through the enveloping black paper, and the impress of the hands will be found upon the plate. This can only be accounted for by supposing that the fingers became in some way radioactive during the experiment. Many psychics can go further than this and can impress upon the plate an image or figure of their thought at the time. Thus, when holding the plate between their palms, or on their forehead, or against the solar plexus, and thinking of a sheep, a cat, a chair, etc., the image of a sheep, cat, or chair is impressed upon the plate. Experiments such as these may be tried by any student, and are of extreme interest and also of value scientifically when they are successful. It is to be hoped that many readers of this book will try experiments of this character and report any results they may obtain. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hia Oyed Carrington Chapter 26 Self-Projection By self-projection is meant the faculty or ability to send out or cause to travel to a distance the etheric self or double by an effort of will. This seems to be, to some extent, inherent in some individuals and occurs with them spontaneously and almost against their will. They go into trance and, at the end of a certain time, find that they have left their bodies and travel to some distant scene. This, however, is rare in the majority of the cases the power has to be developed by long and assiduous cultivation. Of what the thought body is composed before I come to speak of this projection of the self, a few words are necessary as to the nature and composition of this etheric body, or double which is thus projected. The physical body is composed of millions of tiny cells, and in each cell there is a center or nucleus of energy. This center is so infinitely small that it cannot be detected even by the highest powered microscope. All that we know is that physical matter in the cell is in some way vitalized or rendered living when it comes in contact with this vital center. The source of the energy is invisible and cannot be determined by us. It seems to well up from nowhere. Now, this center of energy constitutes a sort of psychic point or cell of its own, and as there are millions of them in the body, Corresponding to the number of physical cells, it is obvious that there are millions of vital cells which conform exactly to the shape of the body, since they correspond to its physical cells in life. These psychic centers have been called psychomeres, and their bulk is estimated at about one millionth that of the physical body. The density of etheric double, therefore, would be about one millionth as dense as the physical body. The combined weight of these psychomeres has been variously estimated, but probably varies between that of the ten post-it stamps and one ounce and a half. 
This would represent the weight of the astral or etheric body, and is such that it would float slowly upward through the physical atmosphere, as would a balloon. This fact coincides with what we know of the gradual floating upward of the spiritual body after death. Inner Finer Bodies it is this body which we inhabit after we discard the denser physical frame. It is not necessary to suppose that our consciousness is scattered throughout the whole of this body any more than it is at present. The center of spiritual activity and the power of the will and mind may be a point of force, so to speak, within this etheric double, and we may utilize and animate it just as we utilize and animate the physical body in this life. After a time, it is probable that we discard this etheric body to assume one of even lesser density, and that this process continues a number of times until the spirit ultimately inhabits one of such infinitely fine matter, if such it can be called, that it is practically a mental or spiritual body. This is what we learn from many spirits who have communicated such facts to us. It is this body, therefore, which becomes disengaged from the physical body during life and goes on trips or excursions, carrying with it the consciousness of the individual and returns to animate the physical body at the end of a certain period of time. Possible dangers and how they are overcome. When this disunion or severance takes place, there is always a connecting link a magnetic cord which unites the physical and the etheric bodies. If this cord were to get broken for any reason, reanimation would be impossible, and the death of the body would take place. This is the great danger attendant upon experiments of this character, but such a phenomena is only possible in cases of very deep trance, where the separation is almost complete and very little serves to disconnect it entirely. It is highly pro improbable that any but the most advanced student could reach this stage, and when he has reached it, certain mystical inner practices may be resorted to, which would offset this possible danger. It is this body which is occasionally photographed, and many so-called spirit photographs are in reality photographs not of discarnate but of incarnate spirits that is they are wandering doubles of spirits still in the flesh again many apparitions and figures seen in haunted house are of this nature they constitute the projections of living persons rather than those who have passed over and it takes an experienced psychic student to distinguish between the two types of figures they have been known to appear at seances, also in the form of materializations. In addition to these etheric bodies or doubles, there may also be mental or thought bodies created entirely by the mind and the will of the subject. Thus, in a case known to us, a clairvoyant was sent on a trip to the house of a friend and asked to describe the individual whom she found there. She described a certain person in detail, hair, eyes, features, etc., given at great length. When the psychic had finished and recovered full consciousness, she was told that her description was entirely wrong, and that no such person existed in the house in question, and her description was throughout erroneous. In order to prove this, a journey was made at once to the house of the subject in question. When the facts were stated, he replied that although he himself did not in any way resemble the clairvoyant description, this corresponded exactly and in one minute detail to a character he was creating and writing about in his book. In other words, his thoughts had created the figure so vividly that it actually lived for the time being as an objective entity, and was seen as such by the entranced clairvoyant. We can see from this, then, that thoughts are things. They assume shape, and, in a certain sense, live in the physical world. 
All our thoughts have a definite shape as well as a definite color. And the more advanced students along the path of development can see and describe these thoughts, we are told, as clearly as we see objects. How the selves may be projected. If this may be true, it has a very significant bearing upon cases which occur and have been reported in the past. For example, the reader will doubtless recall the case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, a most important case for all students to study. Here, as we know, the original individual finally became two. Dr. Jekyll developed another self, calling himself Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll was kindly, helpful, and sympathetic. Hyde was evil, malicious, and wholly repulsive. These two selves were developed in the original person, and the split between them became greater and greater as the months went by. Finally, Mr. Hyde assumed complete supremacy, and Dr. Jekyll vanished forever. In this case, it was not a mere change of personality which could be accounted for on any psychological grounds. It was an actual physical transformation. Apparently, there were two separate bodies, which were transformed one into the other. Suppose now that the good self, Dr. Jekyll, also the bad self, Mr. Hyde, existing as separate mental beings, each had the power of self-projection. They would each create, by their own thoughts, a separate body, and this being would resemble in outward appearance the thoughts which created it cases of this character might therefore exist and might conceivably be explained on scientific principles we must be careful then of the character of the thought self which we build up for if this resembles outwardly its inner structure we may many of us come to resemble monstrosities rather than human beings at some stage of our development when the plane is reached where thoughts predominate and shape the expression of the self this idea has been graphically portrayed in john yuri lloyd's book etudorfa This inner etheric body, which is expelled to a distance by the power of will, in cases of self-projection, may be released and projected by the student after a certain amount of practice. He should go about this cautiously, feeling his way as if it were, but proceeding more or less along the following lines. Place yourself in a perfectly composed attitude either on a couch or in a large chair. Close the eyes and breathe deeply for a few minutes, all the time holding the mind on a central point of concentration. Travel over your body in thought, and at each point or spot dwelt upon by you, will that your etheric body becomes detached or loosened from its connection with the physical body. As you begin to gain control of this process, you may hear or rather sense a process of separation taking place, resembling a click and inwardly feeling like the disconnection of an electric current. When this has been completed at one point, travel to another. Do not try too many on any one occasion, and always be sure to restore by an effort of will the original connected condition before you terminate the experiment. Further directions and advice. After you have gone round your body in this way and have succeeded in disconnecting it more or less completely, you should then call up before you in space a certain distant locality, such as the room of a friend 
and throwing the whole force of your being into a single determined effort of will force yourself mentally to leave your body and travel to the locality before you if you feel that you are losing consciousness or that everything is going black before you discontinue the experiment at once and return to your physical body if you can keep your self-consciousness active you may safely travel to any distance feeling assured that you will be able to return whenever you want to and reanimate your own physical frame all this of course takes time and persistence of development and cannot be acquired in a few days moreover i would advise the student not to attempt this process until he was progressed further in his studies and read the advice contained in the last chapter should he however make up his mind to do so he should proceed along the above lines advancing cautiously all the time and never allowing himself to lose consciousness at any stage of the proceedings when he has acquired this power he will have in his possession a wonderful knowledge and a means of acquiring information and spiritual insight which others who have not developed it are totally unable to comprehend End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 27 Apparitions An apparition is a phantasmal being, commonly called a ghost, which is seen by sensitive individuals under certain conditions. Before we can speak more fully of apparitions, we must answer the question which naturally occurs, namely, what is a ghost? Modern theories and ideas on this question have changed greatly within the past quarter of a century. At that time, if an ordinary scientific man were questioned on this subject, he would probably reply that it was a hallucination, the result of a diseased mind and had no existence in reality outside the imagination of the subject who perceived it. But in these days this idea has been greatly modified, and it must now be admitted that ghosts are very much more complicated than this. In the first place, when the Society for Psychical Research began its investigations in 1882, it was found that a large percentage of cases of apparitions occurred at or about the time of death. Some occurred before and some after, but most of them were approximately at that time. Further, the subjects who perceived or saw them were not diseased or imaginative persons, and probably never had another experience of this character either before or afterwards. The questions naturally arose, why this connection? What is the bond uniting the dying person with the apparition seen? Some scientific men, it is true, have come forward and stated that this connection is due to chance, and that there was no real connection whatever. This is, however, disproved by the report of the society, as the result of several years' work. They succeeded in obtaining answers from some 30,000 persons and calculating the percentage of possible coincidences, they found the number of coincidences was hundreds of times more numerous than chance could account for. Professor Sidgwick's committee, who conducted the investigation, therefore signed the following statement, Apparitions coinciding with death. Between deaths and apparitions of the dying person, a connection exists which is not due to chance alone, this we hold as a proved fact. There is, therefore, some definite connection between the two, and the task was to ascertain its nature and character. The theory was then advanced that, inasmuch as telepathy is a fact scientifically proved, and inasmuch as figures and images may be transferred from one mind to another by this means, the dying person might transfer a vision or image of himself to the mind of some friend or relative, so that this person would see not a real outstanding figure, 
but a mental picture or image of him created by the thought of the dying person and conveyed telepathically to the mind of the living friend these telepathic hallucinations as they are called doubtless account for many of the apparitions which are seen at or about the moment of death also for many of those which occur before death and during the lifetime of the individual but how about those which occur after death here we should have to assume that some other process was involved or else extend our belief so as to cover and embrace the action of discarnate spirits phantasms of the dead one theory of these apparitions seen after the death of the person they represent is that they embody the thought of the dead person for example an individual spirit may continue to think over its life and the scenes of its varied activities and these recollections and thoughts influencing the minds of those still living by means of telepathy would cause them to see the phantasmal image of the person thinking the thoughts this however is a question which we shall discuss more fully in the next chapter for the present, it may be said that this is one theory advanced to explain so-called phantasms of the dead, or ghosts, as opposed to phantasms of the living and phantasms of the dying. Ghosts that touch. There are many cases of apparitions, however, which cannot be thus easily explained by assuming that they are the projection or telepathic influence of a living mind, or the mind of a discarnate spirit. In many cases, they seem to be real substantial beings, to occupy space and exist as real, semi-solid, or material phantoms. Those who have been convinced of the reality of an etheric or spiritual body need have no difficulty in assuming that it, it is this body which is seen at such times. And in many cases, we find strong evidence for supposing that a body of this character actually exists. For example, in one historic instance, a doctor and his wife both saw the figure of a woman standing at the foot of their bed, and saw it cross the room and place its fingers over a small nightlight, which was burning on the mantelpiece. At the moment the phantom thus placed his hands over the light, it was extinguished, and the room was left in darkness. Here it is difficult to suppose that any thought creation or telepathic hallucination of any character existed, for the reason that a physical phenomenon was produced, and no hallucination could have done this. Materialized Phantoms Again, in many cases, the phantasmal form or apparition is seen to open doors, lift curtains, raise bedclothes, etc. And in such cases, again, we must assume that a real phantom exists. The problem is thus more complicated than at first appears, and as Mr. Andrew Lang remarked, consequently, if these stories are true, some apparitions are ghosts, real objective entities filling space hallucinations cannot draw curtains or open doors or cause thumps not real thumps hallucinatory thumps are different dr burns tells of a gentleman who in a dream pushed against a door in a distant house so that those in the room were scarcely able to resist the pressure now if this rather staggering anecdote be true the spirit of a living man being able to affect matter is also so to speak material and is an actual entity an astral body these arguments then make in favor of the old-fashioned theory of ghosts and wraiths as things objectively existing rather than the view that all these ghosts are necessarily subjective in origin phantasms created by thought these phantasms are doubtless thought bodies, in many cases constructed by the operating intelligence itself. One interesting fact in this connection is this, that it is nearly always stated by those who have seen figures of this kind that the phantom is clear and plainly visible about the head and the upper part of the body, but that the apparition dwindles down to a vaporous film toward the feet. 
In other words, the upper part of the body is much clearer than the lower part. If the phantom were a definite thought creation, this is only what we should expect, for we think of the upper portion of our bodies much more than the lower portion. We are more conscious of our head and shoulders, and the upper portion of the trunk, and the hands and arms, and only vaguely conscious of the legs and lower portions of the body. This is exactly what we find in apparitions, and it would therefore seem that the figures are clear in outline just to the extent that the operating intelligence is intensely conscious of the appearance of the body he is creating or building up. Phantoms which impart information. There are also certain cases on record in which the phantom has given the recipient of the experience some important information which he did not know previously, where certain papers are hidden, etc. Such cases certainly prove that an independent intelligence is there, a spirit which is thus manifesting its presence. It must be admitted, however, that most apparitions are purposeless and meaningless, but this is easily accounted for by supposing that we see, at such times, not the spirit itself, but its mere projected thought a phantom created by the spirit, rather than the spirit itself. Most apparitions are, doubtless, of this nature. We have seen that there are apparitions of the living, of the dying, and of the dead, mostly attached to human beings. When they are attached to localities, they become local phantoms or cases of haunting, of which we shall speak in the next chapter. Experimental Apparitions in addition to these, there are so-called cases of experimental apparitions, in which an individual succeeds in creating a phantasmal figure at a distance by an effort of will or thought. These closely resemble certain cases of self-projection on the one hand, and cases of witchcraft on the other, and form an intermediary between them. Since on the one hand they are mere mental pictures, and on the other they are real physical entities. Experimental apparitions, then, seem to bridge the gulf between these two types of phenomena and form a connecting link. Apparitions may be induced experimentally by willing very strongly, just as you are falling asleep, that you will appear to a certain person at a certain time, and, if this is properly managed, it will be successful in a large number of cases. This may also be induced experimentally by means of hypnotic suggestion or magnetic or mesmeric processes, and when in the trance the spirit of the sleeper may be directed to a certain locality and there seen by those present. The natives of West Africa claim to be able to do this more or less at will. They can project the double or etheric body and so to speak materialize at the other end. How to Create Thought Forms The same laws which prevail in many of the previous exercises also rule here. The student should see to it that he retains a grasp of his own personality and does not lose control of his inner self at any stage of the proceedings. As he progresses in his development along these lines, he should endeavor to make the apparition which appears at the other end of the line, so to speak, more or less solid. After he has once succeeded in the process of projection, he should throw all his will into the effort to make the projected form more and more substantial, and to will that his self-consciousness and activity be actually transferred to the distant scene. In this way, he is not only seen by others, who may happen to be present, but is also enabled to see for himself what is actually going on in that place, and obtains, at the same time, a clairvoyant vision of the surroundings in which he has appeared. In this way, both the psychic and those who perceive the created figure mutually exchange experiences, and this process should be continued until the projected double becomes so solid in structure that it cannot be distinguished from a real physical being. 
There are many advanced psychic students who claim that they can actually create and project to great distances material bodies of this nature. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 Of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them By Harroward Carrington Chapter 28 Haunted Houses As explained in the last chapter, when apparitions become fixed or attached to one locality, they constitute what is called a local haunting, and the place they influence is commonly called a haunted house. This is the ordinary or common theory of haunted houses, and the average person probably assumes that the figures seen in such houses are material, and the picture he forms of the ghost is that it is a sheeted figure walking about, up and down stairs, and clanking chains after it. There are probably a few, if any, psychic students who believe that houses are haunted by figures of this description. And opposed to this view is that of ordinary science, which contends that there are no haunted houses at all, the figures seen within them being merely the product of expectancy, suggestion, and excited imagination. The Explanation of Haunted Houses All those who have carefully investigated the subject, however, come to the conclusion, sooner or later, that there are genuine haunted houses. The question is, what constitutes the haunting, and how are such cases to be explained? Many psychic students have specialized, so to speak, in this subject of haunted houses, and have formulated various theories to explain cases of this character. The following are the most important theories which have been advanced. 1. That one person, or group of persons, forming a family, have experienced certain psychic phenomena in the house in question, and these form the nucleus round which gathered impressions, noises, and psychic experiences of all kinds. From a small beginning, great results sprang, elaborated by their own minds. Now when these people moved away from the house in question, and other tenants occupied it, this second group was influenced by the thoughts, emotions, and impressions of those who had moved away, so that they in their turn began to see signs and hear strange sounds, inquiry revealing the fact that the house had the reputation of being haunted, and their own imaginations would magnify the significance of all they had seen or heard. In other words, this theory contends that telepathy, or influence from living minds, is the all-sufficient explanation and alone serves to account for the facts. Telepathy and Psychic Atmosphere 2. The second theory advanced is that telepathy from the dead is the true explanation, the phantom seen, etc., being produced by the influence of minds of deceased persons. On this theory the figures and phantoms are not objective or real, any more than in the first case, but are telepathic hallucinations, just as truly, though they have an objective basis of reality, inasmuch as they have originated in the mind of a deceased person. Dreams or thoughts of the dead constitute, therefore, the basic principle of explanation on this theory. 3. The next theory which is advanced is that some subtle psychic atmosphere permeates the walls of the house in question, and that this atmosphere influences or impresses all those who live within it. There is much to say in favor of such a theory, and the previous chapters on the aura, psychometry, the human fluid, etc., will lend a certain amount of support to it. At the same time, it is difficult to see how a general and impersonal atmosphere of this character could translate itself into definite figures or forms, particularly when these speak and convey information unknown to the seer. I shall say more of this later. Astral Bodies and Thought Forms 4. The fourth theory to be advanced is that the figures seen are the astral or etheric bodies of spirits who return and constitute the haunting, being present in actual fact. This is the nearest approach to the commonly held theory of the figures seen in haunted houses. 5. The fifth theory is that such figures are thought forms, created by some distant, living or disincarnate mind, and projected into the house in question, where they assume more or less definite and tangible form. This is, in a sense, a process of self-projection, but the phantasm is always seen in a certain place, as though magnetically drawn to that locality. The Nature of the Figure Seen Which of these theories is the correct one? In my own estimation there is much truth in all of them, and no two cases of haunted houses are due to the same cause, or depend upon the same conditions. All five of these causes may be operating at the same time in any one house, or any two, three, or four of them may be. 
Indeed, to judge from the complex nature of the phenomena seen, it is highly probable that such is the case. There is strong evidence, in fact, to make us believe that the ordinary hallucination theories will not serve to explain the facts. For example, these phantasms often produce physical phenomena, as before explained, such as opening doors, lifting curtains, snuffing candles, etc. Mental images or pictures could not do this. Again, animals often see, or appear to see, apparitions in haunted houses, and show all the signs of fear, such as trembling, sweating, etc. In the third place, figures are often described differently by different individuals. For example, A would describe a full-face view of the figure, while B would describe the figure in profile. If a real figure were standing where both percipients saw it, this description would be correct. Such cases certainly tend to suggest that a real figure, and no mere hallucination, was present. In the fourth place, apparitions have been seen by two, three, or more persons at once. These collective hallucinations, as they are called, strongly suggest an external phantom in no mere mental picture. Proofs of Reality In the fifth place, apparitions which have appeared to strangers occupying haunted houses have afterwards been identified on being shown the photograph of the person. For example, a gentleman sleeping in a house, reputed to be haunted, sees a certain figure bending over him when he awakes at midnight. He knows details of dress, feature, etc., and also notes that he has never seen this person before in his life. The next day he is shown twenty photographs. From among the twenty he selects one as being the phantom seen in the house. The owner of the house then tells him that this is the person said to haunt the locality in question. Again, we are driven to believe that more than mere hallucination is at work. In the sixth place, these figures, seen in haunted houses, have occasionally been photographed, and this objective and physical proof of their reality is strong evidence that they are more than mental products. Seventh, figures seen in haunted houses often convey, to the seer, definite information or give messages which the individual in question could not have known. This strongly indicates not only the reality of the apparition, but the fact that it is a disincarnate spirit. For these reasons, therefore, we must assume that haunted houses are actual realities, and that the figures seen therein are, at times at least, outstanding entities, and represent more or less directly the individual they appear to portray. Seances in Haunted Houses Psychic students can test their power, and at the same time conduct many interesting and valuable experiments in haunted houses. In an atmosphere of this sort, which is more highly charged with magnetism than the ordinary seance room, psychic powers of any character should be quickly augmented and increased, so that messages could be obtained by speech, vision, automatic writing, crystal vision, etc. Whenever you hear of a case of a haunted house, therefore, you should make it a point to visit this house at once. It is not necessary to sleep in it a night, as many suppose, in order to test its character. Hold a seance in that house in the evening, and striking phenomena will probably result. Or, if you cannot gather together a group of interested students, sit by yourself and see whether you cannot obtain direct messages from the intelligences present. Experiments in automatic writing, crystal gazing, etc. may also be tried. Clairvoyant Diagnosis of Haunted Houses Clairvoyance may also render useful service by visiting clairvoyantly haunted houses and ascertaining and describing, if possible, the source and cause of the haunting. Visit the house by means of a clairvoyant excursion, either spontaneously or when in a mesmeric trance, etc., and use your psychic powers to the utmost to discover what you can regarding this house. When you find yourself inside it, look about and see whether you can sense any spirits, evil or otherwise, lurking among its atmosphere. Endeavor to sense the psychic atmosphere of the house and test the aura of those living within it. All houses, reputed to be haunted, may not necessarily be so, but the individuals themselves may be unbalanced or obsessed for some reason, in which case the house itself would be free, except from those influences which were drawn to it by the individuals residing there. Many persons, living in haunted houses, wish to be free from the depressing influences which sometimes hang about houses of this character, yet do not know how to proceed in order to rid themselves of these haunting presences. This is a very complicated question, and one to which psychic students have in the past given far too little attention. In my book, The Coming Science, there is a chapter entitled Haunted Houses and Their Cure, and I would refer all those interested to the work in question. An interesting case is there given of a haunted house which was cured, so to say, by the following means. How to Cure Haunted Houses A trance medium, Georgia Gladys Cooley, 
was called in to investigate and do what she could, and when in the house, went spontaneously into trance. In that condition her guide spoke through her, and described the haunting spirits. They were then charged to remove them, if possible, and undertook to do so. This they did in a somewhat striking and dramatic manner, and ended by reporting the fact that the haunting presences had been finally completely removed. This is a very instructive case, and shows us that trance mediums and their guides can be of a very great service, in many cases, where the haunting assumes an unpleasant or evil character. Thus the nature of the haunting may be diagnosed clairvoyantly, and the cure effected through some trance medium, and by the spirits who operate through him. In some cases, however, the haunting may be cured by more simple means, such as suggestion, lessening the psychic sensitiveness of those living in the house, by diverting the thoughts, by plenty of outdoor, physical exercise, toughening the aura, etc. On the other hand, there are cases on record where haunted houses have withstood all attempts to cure them, and the inhabitants have ultimately been forced to move. Happily, cases of this character are rare. At all events, haunted houses present a fascinating and useful field, in which the psychic student can test his clairvoyance, or other psychic power, to advantage. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them By Hereward Carrington Chapter 29 The Difficulties of Communication the process of communication is doubtless far more difficult and complicated than the average person believes, and is even more complicated than most spiritualists believe. As stated in a previous chapter, one of the great objections to the reality of spiritualism urged in the past is that, if true, many more persons must communicate than now appear to do so, and that of the thousands who die, more must come back than the few who return through mediums. It was there pointed out that the reason for this consists partly in the fact that, quote, good communicators, unquote, are comparatively rare, and that there is necessarily a peculiar psychical condition which enables them to communicate through mediums. In addition to this, a medium must be present at the time that an effort to communicate is being made and in many cases the recipient of the message must also be reaching out to receive it before it can be given satisfactorily. In other words, the sender and the receiver of the message must stretch out their, quote, mental arms, unquote, so to say, at the same moment before they can shake hands across the great gulf, and if only one does so, he fails to reach the one on the other side. Factors Affecting Communication it has frequently been pointed out by scientific investigators of spiritualism that only after the reality of the facts has been proved does their detailed study begin. For example, supposing that a spirit can write through an entranced medium, she giving the messages in automatic writing. The fact once admitted, the scientific study of the case will only have begun, and such questions as these would then have to be answered. To what extent is the medium's spirit disconnected from the body while the communication is taking place? What is the degree of mental activity of the medium's spirit during the communication? Does the communicating intelligence act directly on the brain and nervous centers of the medium, or in a more roundabout manner? And if the former, upon what brain centers does the intelligence act, and how? If a communicator was in life a good visualizer, or had a good memory, etc., would these factors assist him in the process of communication, and if so, how? These and many similar questions would have to be answered, and it is upon questions such as these that many psychical researchers have bent their energies for some time past. It is probable that several hundred years will have to elapse before these questions can be answered fully, and the facts explained in detail. Difficulties of the Communicating Spirit Let us enumerate some of the difficulties which a communicating spirit probably has to contend with in sending messages through mediums to the living. There is much evidence to show that the process of communication is a very difficult one, for as soon as a spirit gets in contact with the medium and begins to transmit messages, 
he becomes more or less exhausted and suffocated so to speak by the dense aura or atmosphere with which he is called upon to come into contact in many instances we read that spirits have to go away several times during the course of a seance to revive themselves and afterwards return refreshed and clear-brained to continue the communications they experience great difficulty in holding their thoughts together connectedly during the process of communication this does not mean that they are ordinarily in this confused state but very often as soon as they come into contact with the medium's psychic atmosphere and magnetism they become confused and their minds tend to wander as they would in delirium or in a state of trance it is because of this that many of the messages we receive commence well but afterwards dwindle off into incoherence and triviality why many messages are quote trivial unquote this question of quote triviality unquote however is often misunderstood the objection is raised that spirits if they really communicate would tell us something more important than they usually do as a matter of fact however this is only true in a certain sense the ordinary social conversation between quote, spirits in the flesh unquote, is not as serious as it might be and it has been shown by actual experiment that human beings when called upon to prove their own identity to another do deliberately choose trivial incidents by means of which to identify themselves another point is that trivial incidents serve best to prove identity as some great philosophical discourse might be given by any intelligence either in or out of the body and would prove nothing to one longing to hear from his own dear one in such a case personal detailed and so to say trivial messages are often the most striking and the most convincing the very triviality of many messages received through mediums is therefore their strongest point and not their weakest in addition to this there are as we know innumerable books written by spirits containing philosophical scientific and religious truths of great value and importance influence of the medium's organism another reason why communication is doubtless difficult is that the communicating spirit is unused to the bodily organism of the medium all of us have certain mental and physical habits which we form and it is easier for us to do certain things in certain ways after we have done them in that manner a few times if you were suddenly transplanted into the body of another person say one of the opposite sex you would find great difficulty in manipulating that body so as to extract from it the best results to think clearly and to speak and write clearly when expressing your thoughts it is precisely this difficulty which the communicating intelligence experiences in trying to communicate with us through unfamiliar bodies many of the habits and quote, tricks unquote, so to say of the medium creep into the messages which are consequently often more or less similar to the language employed by the medium this proves only that the spirit has to employ the medium's mental and bodily habits as best it can during the process of communication and that it is not as easy and concise as many persons imagine symbolism necessary another difficulty presented is that the conditions on the quote, other side unquote, are doubtless so different from any which exist here that they have to be explained in roundabout and symbolic language if you had to explain color to a blind man you would find great difficulty in doing so if you had to explain the feelings experienced while giving psychometric tests to one who had never experienced them you would also find considerable difficulty it is much the same in this case there are no immediate analogies which can be drawn and the result is that symbolism and a language which appears to us vague and unsatisfactory is often employed in describing the other side of life and the conditions which prevail therein difficulties of names and dates names and dates furnish great difficulty for returning spirits dates because of the fact that time is not recognized by them in the same way that it is with us names 
for the reason that they do not represent concrete pictures or meanings, but are, as a rule, only a combination of letters having a certain sound. The word, quote, chair, unquote, calls up to the mind a certain picture which can be visualized. On the other hand, the name, quote, Robinson, unquote, calls up no such picture, except perhaps the memory image of some friend of yours by that name. If that memory picture is revived in the communicator's mind, the medium can see this and describe it, which is precisely what he does. But the name, quote, Robinson, unquote, cannot be presented in picture form, the most common form of representation, and consequently is not easily communicated. As explained in the chapter on dreams, our hearing centers are less developed than our sight centers, and for this reason verbal messages are less easily given and received than pictured or visualized messages. The difficulty in receiving names is explained largely because of this fact. Communications immediately after death. For some days after death, these difficulties are particularly great, and especially in the case of suicides. Dr. Hodgson, in his report of the case of Mrs. Piper, says, quote, that persons, just deceased, should be extremely confused and unable to communicate directly or even at all, seems perfectly natural after the shock and wrench of death. Thus, in one case, the spirit was unable to write the second day after his death. In another case, a friend of mine, whom I may call D, wrote, with what appeared to be much difficulty, his name and the words, I am all right, adieu within two or three days after his death. In another case, F, he was unable to write on the morning after his death. A few days later, when a stranger was present with me for a sitting, he wrote two or three sentences saying, I am too weak to articulate clearly. And not many days later, he wrote fairly well and quite accurately, dictating also to Madame Eliza, the amanuensis, an account of his feelings when finding himself amid new surroundings. Both D and F became very clear in a short time. D communicated frequently, later on, both by writing and speech." End quote. Other difficulties. Other difficulties remain, such as the probable inability of the communicating spirit to see the material world as we see it, especially at the time of communication. The difficulty of holding the mind together while communicating, the difficulty of manipulating the medium's organism, and the intracosmic difficulties which exist between this world and the next. Because of all these hindrances and impediments, spirits find great difficulty in direct communication, and because of these facts, messages are, comparatively speaking, few, and in so many cases inconclusive. When a good medium, a good communicator, and a sympathetic sitter get together, however, very striking and convincing results are obtained, as we know from the history of spiritualism. End of chapter 29. Chapter 30 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This, Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herr Uward Carrington Chapter 30 Hypnotism and Mesmerism The word mesmerism is derived from Antoine Mesier, who founded the system and who performed all the early experiments in this field. It was known as mesmerism for about 50 years until an English physician by the name of Dr. James Braid coined a new word, hypnotism, from the Greek hypnos, sleep, and this is the word which has been used almost exclusively from that date to this. The difference between hypnotism and mesmerism. The majority of persons would claim at the present day that hypnotism and mesmerism are identical, there being no difference between them. They are both due, it is said, to suggestion and the influence of the mind over the body. Very similar phenomena occur in both cases. It is true, but I believe that there is a difference between the two processes and conditions. Mesmerism is based on the belief that there is a definite 
physical emanation or vital fluid which passes from the operator into the subject while the mesmeric passes are being made over the latter's body hypnotism on the other hand is due entirely to suggestion the influence of the subconscious mind upon the body there is no physical influence or effluence in hypnotic practice and it is claimed that all the phenomena of mesmerism apparently showing such influence are in reality entirely due to suggestion as before stated however we believe that there is a difference between the two processes and that hypnotism is due solely to physical causes but that in mesmerism the human fluid before spoken of plays a part as proof of this i may cite among other proofs the fact that clairvoyance and many of the so-called higher phenomena are frequently obtained in mesmeric trance while there are extremely rare in hypnotic trance other phenomena could be mentioned but this will suffice for the present mesmerism being due to the passage of a vital fluid from the body of the operator into the subject contact and passes are essential if therefore you wish to mesmerize your subject you should make passes over his head forehead eyes and down the front of the body all downward passes are sleep passes and all upward passes are walking passes placing the hands on certain nerve centers of the forehead and particularly between the eyes and over the temples will help to induce sleep also clasping the patient's hands and placing the point of your thumb in contact with the point of his thumb establishes the current and serves to induce the mesmeric trance in hypnotism on the other hand passes are not essential though often help in hypnotizing a subject it is common to ask him first of all to gaze at a bright object until his eyes tire when the lids are closed suggestions of sleep are given or the subject may open and close the eyes a number of times as you count and this will serve to induce the initial stages of hypnotic trance the deeper stages are induced by means of suggestion post hypnotic suggestion is a form of treatment often resorted to and is a good subject for experimentation it means that the subject performs after awaking from trance certain actions suggested to him when entranced he remembers nothing of the suggestions but carries them out to the letter many hypnotic subjects have extraordinary ability in calculating time and can guess to a second the length of time which has elapsed between certain intervals or carry out post hypnotically a suggestion given them in trance days or even weeks before hypnotism is a useful method of opening up and exploring the subconscious mind we are enabled to tap it as it were and get in touch with hidden portions of our being which we could otherwise never reach dreams may be analyzed in this manner also unpleasant thoughts impressions emotions etc removed and frequently undesirable influences banished by hypnotic suggestion hypnotism seems to reach a deeper stratum of our mind than ordinary waking suggestion and because of this fact it is at times so useful for instance the drink habit has often been cured by hypnotic suggestion hence we see that there must be more in the hypnotic command than mere advice or persuasion because of thousands of drunkards have been advised not to drink but they continue to do so nevertheless by means of hypnotism we are enabled to reach a portion of the mind so deep that it controls the whole being and the result is that these deep-rooted habits may at times be removed and eradicated this is one of the distinguishing marks of the hypnotic state that a more fundamental control over the body and mind is obtained 
and by reason of this fact many cures of diseased conditions and abnormal states of mind have been recorded which have been otherwise treated ineffectively there is a difference between the hypnotic and the mediumistic trance though not so great as that existing between the latter and the mesmeric state in both the mediumistic and the mesmeric trance a form of magnetism is doubtless employed and this connects them in a subtle bond of union it is because of this that telepathy clairvoyance etc are so often obtained in the mesmeric trance which is closely akin to the condition secured by mediums in which they obtain genuine mediumistic messages the fear of being hypnotized many persons are afraid of being hypnotized this fear being based partly upon valid reasons and partly upon superstition properly induced by an expert the hypnotic trance is not injurious on the contrary it is often extremely beneficial and as before pointed out quickens the mental and physical powers removes bad habits effects cures etc on the other hand when hypnotism is applied by an ignorant or bungling operator who does not know his business the result may be very detrimental to the health of the person hypnotized a state may be induced which neither the operator nor anybody else fully understands for no one at the present time fully comprehends the nature of the condition thereby induced the conscious mind is removed from its supremacy and that this is often a fatal mistake particularly when there are evil influences at work either within or without the subject if the operator is a sympathetic careful and qualified expert mesmerism may prove highly beneficial for evil influences may thereby be removed by counteracting them and infusing into the subject a supply of beneficial animal magnetism which is opposed to that supplied from opposite sources hypnotic influence from other minds andrew jackson davis began his career as a medium by being mesmerized and others could doubtless develop their mediumistic faculties in the same way but one must be extremely careful in such a case to select a thoroughly competent operator one in whom he has complete faith otherwise more harm than good may result if you find that any one is trying to influence you against your will you may overcome this by a counter suggestion given to yourself from within if the person be absent this may be purely imaginary on your part and the operator in question may be entirely ignorant of the effect he is producing in you there are thousands of persons in insane asylums all over the world who suffer from the belief that they are being persecuted by others at a distance and that these others are endeavoring to influence them by hypnotism etc as a matter of fact nothing of the sort is the case and their condition is purely the result of imaginary belief be most careful therefore that you fully ascertain and prove to your satisfaction the existence of this foreign influence before you take any steps to offset it or even seriously believe that such influence is being directed towards you how to overcome such influences when once you have become satisfied that influences of this character are being directed towards you take immediate steps to protect yourself such as those outlined in chapter twenty three obsession and insanity if promptly applied this will effectively offset such conditions coming from outside minds if you are in the presence of a person whom you feel to be influencing you it would then be best to take the precautions and steps outlined in the next chapter devoted to personal magnetism this will prevent your passing under the influence of such a person you need never fear that hypnotic sleep even if induced will last a great length of time and that the subject cannot be awakened therefrom sleeps of this character always terminate spontaneously if they are let alone though it is always best to see that a hypnotic subject is thoroughly awakened before he leaves the care and supervision of the operator 
otherwise he may go about in a somewhat dazed condition for a time and may not be altogether responsible for his actions an important warning somnambulism is a variation of hypnotic sleep where the subject spontaneously performs a number of complicated actions and the subconscious muscular activities play a large part a person who is subject to somnambulistic attacks should never under any circumstances be awakened suddenly it is a good plan to speak to such a person and suggest to him as to one in hypnotic trance that he return to bed and this done suggest to him that it is impossible for such a condition to again occur etc somnambulistic attacks of this character may often be cured by hypnotic treatment and properly directed suggestion prevention of hypnotic influence an operator may prevent his subject from being hypnotized by any other person through forceful suggestions to his subject that he will be enabled to resist suggestions from any other operator that he will have no effect on him etc if you do not wish to be hypnotized at all you may give similar suggestions to yourself these self suggestions are called auto suggestions lightly given and persistently repeated they will effectively prevent you from being influenced by any other person end of chapter thirty